OK, so um, we're going to continue on Lagrange's equations. We're going to extend to uh, multi-body systems with an example. Before I do so, uh, I, I forgot to underline last time. We finished the pendulum problem with Lagrange's equations. And you've noticed that at some point there was a term MGL sine of theta. And I think this was the Q theta, right? Except maybe a minus sign. I don't remember. Um, just to notice that this, this is generalized force. This is, doesn't have a dimension of a force. This is a dimension of a moment. It's force times distance. This is a dimensional. So in this case, it's almost like having solved the problem with angular momentum, uh, if you like. Um, so that's, that's important to understand, that these are generalized forces. They cannot come up to be anything, depending on what variables you picked. Uh, and then the other post-it I have is, uh, so when we, when we introduce the concept of, of uh, one particle, degrees of freedom, I believe we said, OK, if uh, I need n variables to describe the, uh, in general, the uh, configuration of a system, uh, then we have p constraints, right? We said that m is n minus p, something like that. Uh, and and, and these are the, 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 this is the number of degrees of freedom, right? And I was just watching a portion of that video. I think I said something uh, regarding how the number of generalized coordinates we pick is this little n doesn't have anything to do necessarily with this, but it does have to do something with m. It's usually m. So you do pick a number of generalized coordinates that is equivalent to your degrees of freedom. That uh, should be pretty intuitive. So if I extend this idea to uh, a system of, uh, of particles, so let, let's. One quick yes. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I said at the beginning, I think there was, I wasn't sure about the sign. Yeah, okay. could be, yeah. I just wanted to underline uh, one thing that I forgot, which is, as you can see, you may not get forces at all. You may get something else, something that has a different dimension. Yep, thanks. So let's have, let's, uh, let's have a system of, I want to pick the uh, the letters right so that we don't make confusions here too many. Well, n, yeah. Of, so forget this for now. This is just correcting me, a, a potential statement that I may have made that was uh, not completely correct. So, but let's say that now the the, cis, the number of particles is uh, n. So this is how many points with mass with masses you have. Let's have a system of n particles. Okay. Then. the number of variables needed in general. So this is the case where I, I don't have constraints to um, represent the configuration of the system. So let's have a system of particles. Then the number of variables needed is, is 3n, right? Each particle has at the most three degrees of freedom in, in 3D Euclidean space. So that's the uh, most general case. Then uh, let p be the number of constraints for this system. Constraints. Then the number of degrees of freedom for the system of allow me to just abbreviate DOF, we do this all the time, is, as before, uh, let's call it capital M, it's 3N minus P, and it should be pretty obvious. So you start constraining these variables. Some may be constrained, some may not, but um, you start taking away degrees of freedom. And so we, again, we, we use 
or define the Q1, Q, well, if you use capital M, I will probably go back to a little n. Um, but that you, you, you choose a number of variables that, uh, of generalized coordinates that represent the degrees of freedom. So we define the uh, Q's generalized coordinates. So there's really nothing new here except it's more particles. Then your Lagrange's equations in the two forms become d dt. This is the fundamental form, partial of the kinetic energy with respect to qi dot minus dt with respect to qi equals to. And uh, now we said that this i goes from, from 1 to m, number of degrees of freedom. This is equal to the q changes. Uh, so this q now is going to be a summation over, let's call it j, that goes from what? 1, 2, how many particles do I have? n, right? So you go over every single particle, and you do the dot product of the resultant force acting on that particle with the partial of its position with respect to the whatever variable you're focusing on right now. Because you get m of these equations. For each qi, you get one, one Lagrange equation. So uh, the difference is that you have to do what you were doing before for each single particle. So each particle j has a resultant force acting on it and has a certain position, so you have to find what that is from free body diagram, and bless you, and the position of the particle, and do this dot product. Uh, you have to compute all these partials with respect to the same qi variable for each single equation, and then add them all together. That's the difference. Um, also, the t, if you like, is, is, is actually a summation over the particles um, of all the kinetic energies. That's what you have to do. So you just sum things together, pretty much. And if you go to the other form, so this was the fundamental form, right? These up here. But then if I go to the other one, which tells me d, d, t, d, l, d, q, i, dot, minus d, l, d, q, i, equals to q, uh, i, prime, of course this I didn't write it, but this is what we called qi before. It's just that now it's a summation. Well, the same goes with this. Uh, you have to add all the potential functions. If you have some forces that can be expressed as potential functions, you, you add them all together. So your v becomes a summation over j that goes from 1 to n, all the vj's. There's really no difference. And, and now this qi prime will look like this, except the forces that go in there are all the forces that cannot be expressed as a, as a pot with a potential function, which may be a, a potential energy if they are conservative. We'll do an example when, where we can write the potential function, but not energy for one of the springs. Now, and this is the, uh, what do you call this? The uh, standard form. It's called standard because people like to use this one just because it's nice to have uh, energies, potential energies, and, 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 and remember those. But as always, this class, the rule of thumb is minimize memorization and put yourself in the easiest case, in the most general case. If you don't want to remember potentials or you don't want to open your book to go back and, and deal with the potentials or they confuse you, you're not sure about them, forget about this, just do this. This is the general form. So if you have conservative forces, there's still forces that can go in here. Who cares about writing the potential function or potential energy in some cases? So it's up to you. But this goes back to the, uh, if you recall, the, the version of dh n dt. Which, which version of that formula you remember? The most general one. Just remember that one. And then the case where you do it with respect to the central mass or inertially fixed point is just a simplification of that one. So. Uh, just remember the one you want to remember. OK, questions on these? It's really nothing new, right? 
Okay, let's do an example then. There will be an excuse to refresh a few things. Now, I really need to ask you guys, how many are now solving problems from, I don't want to even say chapter four. I, I really hope that you are in chapter five. Are you? You're not? That's not a good idea. You should really start. I still don't see anyone coming to office hours, which again, I have to assume it means either that you're solving all the problems and you have no issues, or you're not solving the problems. And you know, test two, I don't intend to design it harder in principle than the first one, but unfortunately, all things come together at the end. So it is going in a sense to be harder because you still have to be able to do kinematics and kinetics of particle, of systems of particles, of everything. So um, do start, look at those problems. If you wait until the last minute, it's not a good idea. Just warning you, because this, this stuff is really, it's not difficult. It's just involving more concepts, and they need to be used together. OK, so see what I have here. I think I have the, the springs. Did you try to even start that problem? No? I don't like silence. Silence is dangerous. OK, so we have ground, which is also inertial, of course. And we said that when we do uh, Lagrange's equations, those are in an inertial reference frame. The kinetic energy is with velocities with respect to the inertial reference frame. So uh, that's an assumption of finding those equations. And so we have these three springs here that connect two masses, m1, m2, and then I have k1. K2, K3, and I want the differential equations of motion, and let's do it in all possible ways with Lagrange's equations in the two forms, and then we go back to uh, classical F equal MA, but there won't even be a need to do that because in, 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 in implementing Lagrange's equations, you're still doing kinematics, there's no escape, you're still doing free body diagram, or at least you figure out the forces. So in a simple problem like this, you want to solve it with, uh, Lagrange's equations, you have everything. You really don't need to do anything else. If you really want to write F equal MA, you have all the, all the components. So. so what do you want to do? Get me started here. Same old story. Go ahead. No. Oh, no? You want to say? No. It's too hard? Too many reference frames? How many do I need? One, One reference frame, G. There's only translation here. There's nothing rotating. So how many equations do I expect? Two. It's good to start thinking about this, especially with Lagrange's equations. These are two point masses. In 3D Euclidean space, this will mean that you need six uh, variables to tell me where they are. But this is planar, so that takes away two of them. It's four. It will be an x and y in the plane for both of them. But uh, four goes down to two because they are really constrained to move on this line. Unless I'm telling you that there is something pushing them away from this line, but there isn't, so. So it's two degrees of freedom, I expect two equations. Okay, G is the ground, so after I've defined my reference frame, what do I need to do? Origin, meaning coordinate system, right? I need to define a coordinate system. And this is one of those problems I, I just, I'm just speaking about my experience. This is one of those problems where I would even skip this step because you look at it, it's one, one dimension, it's, it's easy, right? You start saying, oh, this is x1, this is x2, and you get confused and you make a mistake. Because you don't pick an origin, you pick, well, people, what will do? They, will, they, may, they may tell you there is an origin here when this, the whole thing is unstretched, and then another one here. Why would you pick two origins? I've seen it, I've seen it several times. You can do it that way if you want. It confuses me. I don't care if it may end up simplifying my calculations. I would rather have a uh, few more steps, a few more papers, but at least know what's going on. So what I would do, I would just pick the origin maybe here. O, let's call this point down here P, because I'll need it. Okay, so origin at O. That means that everything is measured from this point in that direction. So I just really need one axis. So I say EX 
along OP, right? Why not? So there is a unit vector that goes this way. And so obviously here, it, means, uh, it makes sense to use, I'm going to start with Lagrange's equations. I need to pick my variables, my Q1 and Q2. Q1, Q2, what do we want to call them? x1 and x2. I mean, I have ex uh, going that way. Right? OK. So x1 is the distance between this mass and this point, and x2 is between this mass and this point. And what I also need to tell you is that the unstretched lengths, unstretched lengths of the springs are what? Say L10, L20, L30, something like that. OK, fine. I have all the information. So what do I need to start from for uh, Lagrange's equations? I need the kinetic energy, right? What is the kinetic energy of that system? 1 over 2 m1. V1, remember it is assumed that everything is with respect to the ground, which is inertia. I'm going to drop this just because I'm lazy. But that should be obvious. With Lagrange's equations, that's all we do. Uh, and then M2, V2, dotted with V2. And this is 1 over 2, M1, what? X1 dot squared plus 1 over 2, M2, X2 dot squared. And this is true because V1 will be V1 with respect to the ground, which is the rate of change with respect to the ground of what? Of x1 ex. And since ex is fixed in the ground reference frame, I can do this. I just take the derivative of x1. Yeah, it is very silly to do it, but it's not silly to refresh basic stuff because that's where you can make the worst mistakes. OK, that's the kinetic energy. Fine. Then uh, let's have fun with the spring forces. Because I, in my Lagrange's equation, which is, again, d, d, t, I'm going to start doing it in the, the general form here. I need um, I need the forces here. Now let me just write that position of the first particle is, of course, x1 uh, ex. And position of the second particle is, of course, x2 ex. OK, so in this QI, as I told you, you focus on each single particle. And you need to figure out what are the forces acting on the particle. And then you dot their force with the partial of the position with respect to each of the um, generalized coordinates. So let's focus on the first one. The first one, if you want to really do the, the free body diagram as a spring force Fs1 and Fs2. And I don't mean to say that these are really the forces the way they're, they're going. I'm just drawing a couple of vectors here. And I decide to call them plus Fs1, plus Fs2, because I know how to express them. What is Fs1? Now, you're doing your test. I'm giving you a spring. You need to tell me what is the force on the. So Fs1 means the force coming from spring k1, of constant k1, on the first mass. That's the only mass on which it acts. What is the real expression for the force coming from spring that we defined? Is it something we defined like the friction forces, right? Minus k of that spring, 1. Length of the spring, whatever is the current length, minus the length when it's not stretched, that is multiplying a vector, u, s, 1. This vector goes from the uh, point of attachment to the mass, or the object on which the spring is acting. In that case, if I'm looking at m1 and k1 spring, the point of attachment is O. So this is r1 minus ro over the magnitude of this. And I know that this is a simple problem, and you're tempted, as I am, to just jump to conclusions. But 
If you apply the definition, that's how you avoid making mistakes in jumping to conclusions. This is easy, but I still want to do it. So what is R1? Is X1 EX? What is X R0? It's 0, because uh, that's my origin. And this is the norm of X1, which happens to be positive, because X1 will never be negative unless M1 decides to break through the wall and go the other way, which we are excluding can happen. So this is EX which I know I could have said right away, because if it goes from the point, uh, the attachment point to the mass, it's obviously EX, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to do it. Okay, what is um, L1? It's, yeah, but this is just the magnitude, so this is X1, and then L10 is whatever I give you, it's a number. So, this first force, and I, I really want to write them here, because once I find them, I, can, I, may, I may reuse them a few times. This first force, Fs1, is, uh, is that minus K1, X1 minus L10, EX. Okay. Same kind of procedure for the other one. Now, Fs2 is... The way I've defined it, I'm looking still at mass 1, so it is whatever that spring, the second one, is doing on the first mass. So I look at mass 1 as uh, the mass, and whatever is on the other end of the spring is the attachment point. It doesn't matter that, that it's moving and it's another mass. It is the attachment point, because I am looking at the free body diagram of this mass. So this is minus K2, whatever is L2, we'll figure it out. So the length of that middle spring in general, minus L20, whatever is uh, its length when it's not uh, stretched or compressed, US2. And the way I defined it, US2 is now R1 minus R2, because this happens to be the attachment point for that spring, the way I'm looking at it at least, R1 minus R2. And this is X1 minus X2 times EX over the norm of this. What is this? The absolute value. I removed, uh, when I do the norm of a vector, in this case, it's the norm of the same vector, it's up here, so the norm of EX is one, so it, it ends up being the absolute value of the difference in, uh, between X1 and X2. What is that? And what is that? So you need to tell me what that is. So if, if it's not greater than X2, then... Can it be big, greater than X2? No. no. Yeah. Unless you really allow them to, you know, go inside each other and exchange positions, we, which we don't allow them to do. So this is a minus. I'm sorry? They could do it, but we're doing Newtonian mechanics still, so no relativistic mechanics here. So, um, so this means that these can be... You, you remove the norm, and this is minus parenthesis x1 minus x2. So in other words, is minus ex, and it makes sense. Goes from attachment point, which is m2, to the mass, which is m1. So uh, now L2, what is L2? The length of that spring in the middle in a genetic you know, configuration. What is it? x2 minus x1. And so done with this as well. I don't think I can simplify anything else. So Fs2. Why is minus EX? Geometrically speaking, the way we define the unit vector that um, gives you the direction of the force of the spring is from an attachment point to the mass. I, I see so I'm focused. Okay, there. Okay, so Where from? it's coming from if I do X1 minus X2 EX over the, mag the uh, absolute value of X1 minus X2. Since I know that x1 minus x2 is always negative, I can remove the absolute value by changing the sign of that. So, oh. make sense? So, simplify this, you get minus ex. This is basic stuff, but you can't skip it. If you do, that's at least that's where I make mistakes. If I try to. Skip it. So what am I doing? Minus K2, X1 minus X2. Uh, I'm sorry, X2 
2 minus x1, yeah. Minus whatever is the length when it's not uh, stretched or compressed. Then there was a minus there. So if you want, let me do this. I'll change the signs in here. I know this is not looking there. better. OK, that's FS2. So as you can see, you do Lagrange's equations, but in some cases, in most of the cases, you can't really escape. Kinematics, you never escape it, never. It should be clear at this point that without being able to deal with the geometry of motion, there is no dynamics. You're dead. If you, if you want to do dynamics with no kinematics, just do something else. OK, so let's see. And then I'm doing the second one, M2. See, I had FS2 that way, so I'm going to start with this. I'm going to tell you that there is a force from the, first, from the last spring, and that's, that's OK. What do I have on the other side? Minus FS2. This is Newton telling me again. See, again, there's no escape from Newton. That guy was just way too smart. Minus FS2. Action reaction. These are two masses. They're exchanging forces between them, and it's, uh, they need to be equal and opposite. Doesn't matter if it's from a spring or they're just throwing stones at each other. I don't know what it is, but uh, whatever M2 is doing on M1, M2 is receiving the equal and opposite uh, type of action. So, so I don't really need to recompute this. It's just the, you know, changing the sign of that vector, FS2. And so FS3 is the only one that I need to deal with. And that's, uh, again, minus K3, L3, minus L3, 0, US3. And you know that this is minus EX, but if you really want to do it, it's, it's uh, the vector that goes from point of attachment to the mass. So it's the, uh, uh, what is it, R2 minus R of P over R2 minus RP. And so what is this? R2 is X2 uh, EX. Let's say that the addition of all these things is some, some, I don't know, capital L, just to make it shorter. So this is minus LEX. That's the position of point P, right? Over the uh, norm of x2 minus L. Same kind of thinking. x2 is not going to break, you know, the second mass is not going to pass point P. So this ends up being, as before, minus EX. L3, what is L3? Length of the last, uh, last spring there. What is it? Capital L minus X2, right? So it's L10 plus L20 plus L30 minus X2. OK. And so if I put it all together, let me do it here, actually, so that I can copy it there. FS3 is minus K3, all this thing minus L30. So this goes away. I have L10 plus L20 minus X2 times minus EX. So I'm going to change the signs in here. And I'm telling you that FS3 is equal to minus k3 uh, x2 minus l10 minus l20 ex. Any mistakes, any errors we have here? I don't think so. OK. Keep the kinetic energy up there. Nah, I should have kept these two. Now, if I want to compute the Q, capital Q1, the first generalized force that is associated with x1, which is my first generalized coordinate, that is going to be what? Q1 is going to be, I have to go over the masses. So the first mass has force Fs1 plus Fs2. This is the resultant of all forces acting on M1. Yes. In doing the free body diagram, I forgot there could be a reaction here, but I didn't tell you there is gravity. We don't really care. There's no motion in that direction. So you may be pushing on this mass. There is a reaction equal and opposite. It doesn't make any difference. They go away. So uh, this needs to be dotted with the partial of R1 with respect to, I'm doing 1 
x1 ah, with respect to x1 that takes care of the first mass. Then I have the second one. The second one is fs3 minus fs2, which needs to be dotted with its, uh, the partial of its position, dr2, with respect to the same variable, x1, partial of x1. And uh, let me rewrite here for a second r1, which is x1 ex, and r2, which is x2 ex. OK, what is this? First of all, partial of r1 with respect to x1 is ex. Partial of r2 with respect to x1 is 0. So this can go away, right? And so I just have to add these two forces because I dot the two forces which happen to be along the x with the x itself. Make sense? So the only thing that I'm left with is a scalar, which is minus k1 x1 minus l10 uh, minus k2 minus x2. Uh, let me write it another way here. Uh, x1 minus x2 plus l20. And then actually can already give you the first equation, because um, what do I need to do? to put together a Lagrange equation. I have the kinetic energy. I need to take its partial with respect to, in this case, I'm looking at the first equation, with respect to x1 dot. And that is equal to m1 x1 dot. Correct? I need to take its partial with respect to x1, but that's, that's 0 in this case. And then from this, I have to also take the derivative with respect to time which is m1 x1 double dot. So that's my first equation. If I equate this to q1, I get my first equation of motion. Kind of running out of space here. So equation 1 is m1 x1 double dot equals all these minus k1 x1 minus l10. 2, x1, minus x2, plus L20. That's my equation number one, right? Did I forget anything? That makes sense. OK, second one. Questions, concerns? No. Ah. I shouldn't really erase the whole thing, but that's OK. Now q2, likewise, first mass as fs1 plus fs2 dotted with it, the partial of its position with respect to the second variable now, which is x2 plus, I'm looking at the second one, it's an fs3 plus, minus fs2, which is dotted with dr2 with respect to dx2. As before, and now in this case, dr1, partial of r1 with respect to s2 is 0, so this goes away. And so I get uh, the partial of r2 with respect to x2 is, is ex. So I'm going to dot ex with those, the difference between two of those. So still get you know, a 1 out of that dot product. So I do get basically fs3, the norm of X, fx3 minus fs2. So whatever that is, minus x3 minus k3, x2 minus l10 minus l20, that's it, uh, minus fs2. Now, um, I write it as a vector, minus fs2. So yeah, I need to change the sign of this, because that's fs2. OK, plus k2, um, x1 minus x2 plus l20. And the same type of procedure here, dt in the x2 dot is m2 x2 dot. Its time derivative of this is m2 x2 double dot. This does not depend on x2, so the other partial is 0. So my second equation is, it will never fit in here, maybe like this, m2 x2 double dot equals all that. 
Let me put this first. K2, x1 minus x2 plus L20 uh, minus K3, x2. OK. So these are my equations of motion. Not too bad, right? Questions? Now, if you want to do it the other way, <clears throat> which is potentials, those forces can be expressed as potential uh, functions. Now, if you go back to the chapter that you should have studied about uh, conservative forces, conservative forces are forces that I can express. So if conservative force is something that can be expressed as minus the gradient over the inertial position r of some function v, which we call we call the potential energy, right? So let me actually call it u, just to differentiate it from v. Now this is inertial position. So I need to be able to write a function u, which is a function of the inertial position of, of the particle of interest here, so that I can call that force conservative. And for the case of a spring, that means the springs have to have a f an inertially fixed point, the attachment point, which is true for the first and last. is not true for the one in the middle. But I can still write the potential energy. So OK, so what is, um, what is V1? You are supposed to study that stuff, right, by yourself? Go through the potential energies. So V1 in this case is actually a potential energy, not just a function. What is it? Remember? If I, if I, if I uh, take the partial of this with respect to this, to x1 actually, because that's the position, the inertial position, in this case you do have it, um, of the first mass, uh, you get Fs1, right? V2, well, V3. Let me do V3 because it's, it's, it's also the conservative one. It's 1 over 2, K3, uh, whatever is in that parenthesis pretty much, X2 minus L10 minus L20 squared. Then V2. It's, I mean, it's, it looks the same. So formally, you write it the same way, but it's not a conservative force. So you can go back and try to demonstrate that to yourself that it's not a conservative force because, for example, the, uh, basically if, you, if you take two, two masses and a spring in the middle and you let them go, you will not conserve the total energy. Or the work done by that, those forces are not independent of the path they follow. All those things that tell you that a force is non-conservative. But mathematically speaking, same formula. So x1 minus x2 plus L20, right? That's, that's what we have there. Square. No? Square. Square. Yeah. 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 And so my Lagrangian is, if you recall, if you want to do the standard form, is t minus v, right? So t is still the same. And so when you start doing, um, I'm not going to rewrite every step here, but I'm just going to observe that when I start doing the, the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the x i dots, I have, I have two x's here. Um, well, it doesn't affect these ones, right? So the first piece remains the same, because then you take the d dt of these, so you still have m1 x1 double dot, m2 x2 double dot, that, that comes from there. And of course, when, you, when you're going to do the partials of this with respect to now the x's, you should get these, these other terms here. And then this case doesn't really have any, <clears throat> any uh, qi prime. These are all zeros. There are no forces that cannot be expressed as a potential function. And let's just look at it and see if it works. If I, if I look at uh, x1 
Remember that V needs to be the addition of all these. So let's see what happens. The partial of L with respect to x1 doesn't affect T, so this doesn't contribute. Let's look at those. I get K1, so I'm doing the partial of V1 with respect to x1. Yeah, the 2 goes away, K1, and remember it will be on this side, so I actually moved it to the other side, but that's okay. So um, K1, X1, minus L1, fine. And then V3 doesn't have X1, so forget about that one. So as I go to the, sec to the last one, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have them in order here. So this that gives me the partial of, of V1 with respect to X1 gives me this component, K1, X1, minus L1, 0. The partial of V3 with respect to X1 will give me nothing, 0. V2 will give me this last one, except signs. But remember, I have everything on the right-hand side here. And then I do the same type of thinking for uh, X2. Um, V1 doesn't give me anything. So I go to the V3, for example. If I do the partial of V3 with respect to X2, it will give me this, of course. And the same for V2. Make sense? Do you need to actually spell it out, write it? No. no? No? Makes sense? OK. So this is one example where, I mean, once you figure out the forces, I mean, you can, you can do it in multiple ways. And if I wanted to do it with f equal ma, which is actually what I'm getting here, and the reason why I'm getting directly that is because I picked Cartesian coordinates. So if I was going to do it directly with this, well, ma, here it is. These are the two accelerations, right, times the masses. And the forces is what we had to figure out. So there's really nothing else you can say here. Uh, but you do need, when you, do, when you use Lagrange's equations, you still need to do kinetics. I'm sorry, kinematics, figure out velocities. That's an escape. It's part of the kinetic energy. Um, and, and free body diagrams. So it's still there. Questions on this? No questions on this? Do you guys have any questions in general? I mean, if you haven't even started Chapter 5's problems, I'm telling you, you're not in great shape. You should have. I would like to hear questions about problems from that chapter. As I said, I'm going, I'm going to go back to rigid body. Actually, next time I will, uh, I will start deriving the, uh, <clears throat> the kinetic energy for a rigid body. And uh, let's just, I'm just giving you a heads up here. Because Lagrange's equations, which we're not going to derive, but they, they work also for rigid bodies. Uh, the formulation looks very similar except T, which in the case of systems of particles, is the addition of all the kinetic energies. Um, for, a con for a generic continuum or you know, rigid body, it doesn't, it, it's not that simple. What would be actually the starting point to write the kinetic energy of a rigid body? What would you do? You can tell me. Again, you're not going to be on video. No one will recognize your voice. You don't want to tell me anything? Just buy those machines that change your voice, so like in the movies. What is T for a rigid body? And of course, this is again, in the, in, everything is in the inertial reference frame. So this is a rigid body here, R. Bunch of points that respect the condition of being a rigid body, so the mutual distances, these are at least three known collinear points, and their mutual distances do not change with time. Um, so in general, you would have 1 over 2 integral over the body of Vn dotted with Vn in the M. And remember, this is not a uh, Riemann integral. It's a Lebesgue integral. So this rigid body can look like a continuum, or it can be a bunch of points. Um, that are at fixed distances with each other. So a triangle with three masses is also a rigid body, as far as we are concerned. Do you agree with this? You have to go over the body. Can you tell me, so we're, we're, we're going to derive this next time. Can you tell me something about rigid bodies? 
So a rigid body can do two things that correspond to Euler's laws. It translates and it rotates. And we have F equal MA center of mass in an inertial reference frame, where F is the result of all external forces that the first law Euler. The second one is the one with the angular momentum. So they both tell us uh, what's going on. The first is about translation. The second is about rotation. So nice. As we will see, this will actually end up being composed of two pieces, one that has to do with translation and one with rotation. So there is a much nicer way to write this, because you cannot really do anything with this. If I give you a problem where you need to use Lagrange's equations or for some reason express something in terms of uh, express the kinetic energy, I mean, can you, can you really do it here with an integral? There's no use for this. This is a starting point. But there is a, way, a nicer way to write this. Once again, you can't forget anything. And especially kinematics, without kinematics, don't even, don't even think about showing up a test tube. So, well, you don't need to show up because you take it on, but that's okay. Um, don't open that email. So, what can you tell me about a rigid body? What is, what, we've done a few things about rigid bodies. A few, there's a few, a few concepts. And before we went into kinetics, we did kinematics of rigid bodies. What is true about a rigid body? Come on. What is true about a rigid body? Hmm? Say that this is a central mass, right? So instead of P and Q, I'm actually giving you central mass and another point. If I can tell something about the central mass, I'm telling something about the translation of the body. And then, and then there will be another piece. But what can I tell between? That, that relates a, a point and another point. And I'm picking one of them to be the central mass because it's really convenient. Yeah, and the fact that, that, that this distance is fixed, as is true for any other point, couple of points, actually led us to find what? Yes, velocity of that point Q, which would be my generic point. Remember, this is the velocity of any point of the rigid body. Velocity of a, a generic point of the rigid body minus the velocity of the central mass is equal to what? Omega. What omega? Uh, R n, the angular velocity of the body with respect to the inertial reference frame, cross R minus R bar. That's the starting point. We're going to stick these in there. So Vn is actually equal to this plus this, if you want. Uh, and, 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 and use a few tricks that I actually have in my notes because I don't remember the triple cross products uh, on top of my mind. I, I refuse to do that. But uh, by starting from this, and by the way, I told you to study this stuff, right? Yeah, I hope you did. But if you haven't, I uh, will do it. So uh, starting from this, we'll see how this will be split into a component with, has to do with translation, which is pretty nice and we can write easily. And another one that has to do with rotation, which is also pretty nice and uh, doesn't have to be as ugly as an integral, which we cannot reuse. All right, guys? And we need this for, uh, for Friday when Levin will come and show you how he's using Lagrange's equations for uh, spacecraft. So, okay, have a good weekend. <laughs>